So my, my name is uh, Frank German. Um, I'm an associate professor at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and the paper is uh, joint work with uh, Steve Anderson from UT Austin, uh, Pradeep Chintagunta from the University of Chicago, and Nafil Vikasim from uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, they're all in uh, attendance today. Um, before I get started, I, I wanna thank Rajesh, Gita, Chris, and John um, for putting together th this special issue um, on better marketing for a better world and also this, this initiative on better uh, marketing for a better world. Um, I, I'm really not sure how and where you found the time and energy to pull this off, but I think the outcome is, is fantastic. Um, so, th so thank you. Um, uh, thank you also for organizing this forum uh, here today and uh, for the opportunity uh, to present our research. Um, so uh, speaking of our research, um, so our project was uh, to a certain degree motivated uh, or inspired, um, if you will, by uh, Betterjee and Duflo's seminal work in development economics. Um, this picture uh, here of the two was taken shortly after they found out that they co-won the 2019 uh, Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, and uh, so we know from their work that most of the entrepreneurial businesses in emerging markets are, are too small and uh, utterly undifferentiated from the many others. Uh, and it's because of that, uh, that many of the entrepreneurial businesses of which of course there are many in emerging markets uh, fail uh, or at least um, fail to grow. Um, and, uh, and this is really too bad because there's, there's evidence that you know, all else equal, when small entrepreneurial firms in emerging markets grow, good things tend to follow, right? So entrepreneurship is, is considered to be a critical mechanism for economic development. Um, and many argue that entrepreneurship is one and maybe uh, you know, the most effective means to alleviate poverty in uh, developing countries. Um, and uh, so, so, so considering Benergy and Duflo's quote, uh, that there's really a need to foster and build differentiated businesses in emerging markets, right? And, and marketing, when you, when you think about it, really helps firms differentiate by focusing on the question, you know, why should the customer buy from the firm and not elsewhere, right? Um, and against this backdrop, we reasoned that given marketers unique training and, uh, you know, experience, if you will, they should be able to help the entrepreneurs build differentiated businesses. I, that's, that's really what marketing um, is all about. Um, but the question, of course, is, you know, how, how can you do that? And in, in a nutshell, um, what we're proposing and testing uh, in our study here is if marketers could serve as remote coaches to entrepreneurs in emerging markets. And uh, what, what we mean by remote coaching is that we you know, connect emerging market entrepreneurs with experienced marketing professionals from more advanced markets, um, but, but do that um, re remotely. Okay, and so so the the study, oops, let me go up. Here we go. The the study took place over the course of uh, two years, uh, and we partnered with a nonprofit called Grow Movement, uh, which is based out of London. And I think uh, uh, actually I saw Chris Coblin, the founder uh, of Grow Movement. He's in attendance. Uh, he's here today. Um, and thank you so much for for all the support. Um, so we, we recruited uh, coaches from all over the world. Uh, and uh, this map here shows uh, where the coaches were from. And then we randomly assigned these coaches to 530 treated entrepreneurs in Uganda uh, who participated in the study. And uh, another 400 entrepreneurs were randomly assigned into the control group. Um, so they did not get any coaching, but they served as a counterfactual uh, against which we could compare the treated entrepreneurs. and. Uh, the, the virtual meetings between the coaches um, and the entrepreneurs in the treatment group uh, took place mostly via Skype over the course of two to six months. Um, and you know, Grow Movement also provided in-country intervention managers to facilitate introductions and ensure that the collaborations continued on, on schedule. Um, otherwise, uh, the intervention managers really didn't, didn't intervene. And, uh, you know, as I'm sure you can see, you know, one of the potential benefits of this study design is that the coaches, you know, they didn't have to travel to the countries, but they could connect uh, with the entrepreneurs from the comfort of their homes uh, or offices or, you know, wherever they wanted to. And uh, so uh, the coaches uh, who we, you know, or Chrome Movement recruited, 
uh, had various functional backgrounds, um, as you can see here on this slide. Um, for, for our analysis, uh, we, we set the group size minimum at 100 firms uh, to provide sufficient statistical uh, power. Um, so, so we had three experimental groups, um, coaches with a marketing and sales background, um, coaches with a consulting background, and then uh, coaches with an, another background. So that's the, the remaining coaches here. And uh, so here's uh, where the entrepreneurs uh, were based. Um, most, most of them were based in the greater Kampala area, um, which you can see here. And Kampala, of course, is the capital of, of Uganda. And uh, then here's a picture of uh, two of the interventions. So that's when the coaches uh, met with the entrepreneurs. Um, you can sort of sort of see uh, the coaches on the screens here. Uh, again, the, 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 the meetings were all done virtually and in some you know, cases happened actually multiple times per week. Um, and again, as mentioned, um, they mostly met by Skype video conferencing, uh, but sometimes they also used other tools, um, uh, you know, such as uh, WhatsApp or, or email, um, et cetera. And uh, uh, here's a picture of actually one of the entrepreneurs who participated in this study. Um, and this entrepreneur really focused on, you know, understanding his customers and creating unique value, um, you know, for the customers. Uh, and, uh, you know, really in a, in a nutshell, uh, so he's working with a coach. And what he did is he created a new cooking sauce made out of fish and different spices that, that really resonated uh, with his customers. And, uh, you know, this, this sauce, from what I understand, goes very well with fish and rice meals. Um, and, you know, his, his coach encouraged him, and there's a marketing coach, um, to, to go out and talk to customers and get, get you know, customer feedback. But, you know, in the end, the coach was, uh, you know, not, not there, you know, physically. So it's really the entrepreneur who did, you know, most, most of the things himself. And uh, then here, here are the results, um, sort of high-level results um, of, uh, you know, how business performance of the different groups changed from before the intervention to after the intervention. Um, so as you can see, the marketing coaches uh, significantly and positively impacted the uh, entrepreneur's firm growth. So the blue bar here uh, captures the marketing treatment effect, the gray bar, so that's the, that's the control group. Um, so in the y-axis of the graph um, represents the pre to post uh, change in firm growth, um, which is you know, captured by a, a standardized index of two sales measures, two profit measures, two um, employee measures, and two um, asset measures. Um, also, so average monthly sales of the treated entrepreneurs increased by about 2 million uh, Ugandan shillings, or about 51%. Um, and uh, uh, monthly profits on average increased by about 300,000 Ugandan shillings, or about 36%. And, um, uh, you know, to put it in context, so these, these are really meaningful average increases as, you know, for example, um, mean monthly rent at the beginning of the study uh, for the entrepreneurs was about 300,000 Ugandan shillings. So as part of the study, uh, we also examined why marketers uh, you know, had such a positive effect. We looked at the um, underlying mechanism, um, also looked at some heterogeneous treatment effects. And you know, in a nutshell, our mechanism analysis indicate that the, the marketers, so the marketing coaches, they were so effective because they really helped the entrepreneurs become more differentiated. And again, this is sort of a cap capability um, that, that many of the entrepreneurs sort of lacked beforehand. And uh, so then I guess, you know, what are the implications for practice and for um, a better world outcome? Well, um, you know, given marketers positive effect on entrepreneurs, you know, we would argue that our findings sort of highlight the need for the marketing field's increased presence uh, in emerging markets, right? So again, marketers, uh, they, seem to really help emerging market firms differentiate their product offerings, which again is sort of a key driver uh, for growth. Um, and again, as mentioned earlier, it's shown that flourishing entrepreneurship is, is one of the most helpful ways to reduce poverty um, in, in emerging markets. Um, also, you know, government organizations and NGOs, they invest billions of dollars in business support interventions um, every year to fight poverty in emerging markets. And, and we really hope that our findings will earn marketers a seat at the policy table with organizations such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and the United Nations. And you know, 
think it's fair to say that our results suggest that these organizations should really consider how marketers and marketing tools can be integrated into solutions uh, for stimulating growth in, in emerging markets. And uh, then finally, you know, what, what, what would be some emerging research questions? So, you know, we think there, there are many, uh, but here are, I guess, some that uh, we're sort of currently thinking about that we're currently uh, investigating. Um, so in this study, we, we randomly assigned volunteers to entrepreneurs as part of our experimental setup. Um, so, you know, we didn't match volunteers and entrepreneurs on the basis of their backgrounds. Um, unfortunately, um, fem female emerging market entrepreneurs often experience lower returns from business support interventions. Um, so we, we see that in our study too. So, so that begs the question, you know, why, why is that? And, and, you know, what can be done uh, to sort of facilitate more inclusive growth? Uh, and we have some ideas and initial findings about that. And you know, we can talk more about it later if you're interested. Uh, in addition, the, the marketing literature is really sort of largely neglected in entrepreneurial firms, which is sort of surprising given really the important role that uh, such companies play across really all markets. And the entrepreneurship literature has also largely ignored marketing, which is you know, sort of equally surprising because you know, some people have argued that marketing is, is really sort of the home for the entrepreneurial process. Um, so in general, we think more research in the marketing entrepreneurship interface domain, um, you know, considering both emerging and developed markets could be, you know, quite interesting. Um, and there are, you know, many different angles one could look at, but a question we're currently in, interested in and, you know, in, in sort of investigating is whether or not emerging market entrepreneurs might sort of benefit from experimentation or sort of the lean startup methodology that, uh, you know, you've probably all heard of uh, when they launch new products. Um, and then finally, you know, a lot of MBA education, consulting, and existing sort of research focuses on improving the fortunes of really the rich companies, right? And unfortunately, this, this leaves behind the poor organizations, right, that lack resources. Um, so, so we think research that, research that is targeted at sort of helping poor firms gain access to resources, you know, or capital, if you will, um, could be very meaningful. So, so one question that comes to our mind is if, you know, getting closer to customers might enable emerging market entrepreneurs to get closer to capital and increase their odds of gaining uh, access to loans, um, et cetera. So that, uh, I guess, uh, concludes my brief presentation. I hope I stayed within the 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> thanks much for listening and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start by taking you to a marketplace and uh, uh, very briefly, so I'm going to request a screen sharing. There you go. Uh, just to situate uh, what we do and make myself a little homesick uh, you know, along the way. Uh, let me just make sure and play exactly this. Exactly what a subsistence marketplace, you know. So people coming together, farming their marketplace. And, uh, you know, uh, this is as much a subsistence marketplace as anything we can think of when we think of this whole journey and this whole stream of work. And also it's very interesting because, well, this is survival. This is barely making ends meet. And you see people buying and selling. You see the social blurred with the economic. You see people, you see group. You can't separate out the social and the economic. You can't separate out the human and the economic. All of that's going on. Uh, so this is a Saturday marketplace uh, in Oldonia Sambu uh, near Arusha, and uh, you know it, it, it basically it, it's 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 for isolated tribal communities who have to walk a very long way to get to this kind of a marketplace. Uh, it could be an hour, it could be two hours, and so on. And so this is the kind of context where uh, 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 our some of our studies were situated. Uh, so just to give you an idea. I just also wanted to say uh, that I just had an amazing uh, team. Uh, Nita, Arun, and Ashley just made this uh, uh, such a wonderful experience. It's been a privilege to work with them. Uh, a couple of things just to frame all of this. Uh, we're really talking about the broad range of low income when we talk about subsistence marketplaces, except here we 
we went from uh, certainly poverty to extreme poverty in the studies. Uh, we also have approached low income by unpacking it in terms of what goes with it, which is low literacy. It's not just material poverty. It's also difficulty with the, some of the cognitive things we take for granted because of an education, uh, difficulty with abstract thinking. The very words we use like marketplaces and enterprise and health and nutrition have a much more concrete meaning, if at all, in these contexts, even the word consumer. So I want to emphasize that. We use marketplaces in a couple of different senses. One is, of course, the marketplace you just saw, and the other is the broader notion of marketplace literacy and so on. Uh, the other aspect of this is how consumption and entrepreneurship are intertwined. They are two sides of the same coin. People learn in shared adversity to be an entrepreneur because they're a consumer and so on. And of course, these are contexts when, uh, where you know, uh, being a, an entrepreneur is often a necessity. It's a way out, perhaps even a way up, as we saw with the earlier paper as well. Um, so those are some of the things I wanted to emphasize. And then with that, I'm going to pass it on uh, to Ashley. Thank you, Madhu. So why did we study this beyond just the obvious of the need, right? The, these consumers are really powerful consumers. There trillions of dollars are spent in this type of marketplaces by subsistence consumers. And huge companies are also making products for these specific people, um, like Nokia or PNG. But subsistence consumers are actually struggling, sometimes even unable to effectively participate in these marketplaces. And so next slide, please. The question would be then, why? What's missing? What don't we know about these consumers? So to answer that, next slide, please. We're looking at marketplace literacy. Marketplace literacy is the knowledge and skills that enable marketplace participation, both as a consumer and also as an entrepreneur. So both sides of marketing, as we just heard in the last presentation. Um, Marketplace literacy, it goes beyond just the consumer, right? And incorporates the entrepreneur because we want to know the what, like what are we buying, the how, how do we buy it as consumers, but also the why. Why is it priced this way? Why are they offering these products to us? And ultimately, if you look at the figure at the bottom of the screen, you can see that it leads to better decision making. We can literally participate as a consumer better. Um, next slide, please. Also, what we have noticed is that Marketplace literacy can come from just the access to the marketplace. So as Madhu had said, it's hours sometimes for them to get to a marketplace. And so if we're there, we're interacting with sellers, we're interacting with each other, we're seeing the physical products, picking them up, looking at them. This is all teaching us about being a consumer, about being an entrepreneur, what's around us. Yet many lack that basic access. So we're taking it for granted. We're not, as marketers, we're not necessarily looking beyond just the product. We're looking at how can they get it? How can they get in these types of marketplaces? Next slide, please. So this is, leads to the gaps in literature. There is no empirical evidence, um, very little, but really none of the benefits of marketplace literacy. And then also we want to look at the consumer education the literacy part with the addition of entrepreneurship. So looking at both sides of the literacy, and then finally, pathway of marketing related literacy and how that pathway leads to the better world outcomes is really unclear. So we're trying to answer all of that. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Arun to talk about our thesis. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, so we had three central predictions of this research. Uh, we predicted that an increase in marketplace literacy would be associated with an increase in psychological well-being, uh, meaning that individuals will feel uh, more empowered and autonomous to make their own choices. Secondly, we predicted an increase in consumer well-being uh, with higher marketplace literacy, which means that individuals will be able to confidently make marketplace decisions, such as um, assessing the quality of products and, and uh, comparing prices. We also predicted an increase in entrepreneur-related well-being, which incorporates the entrepreneurial intent and actually starting a micro-enterprise. Now, we, uh, we, we thought that these predictions are contingent on the degree of access to the marketplace. Now, while the psychological and consumer related benefits will be greater for those with low access to marketplaces, uh, entrepreneur related benefits will increase with higher access to marketplaces, 
uh, because entrepreneurship requires recognition of business opportunities from the market, as well as access to uh, market infrastructure. Next slide, please. So our approach to test these predictions uh, was to make use of an already established marketplace literacy program, uh, which is being offered as a four to eight hour program in several countries. So our goal was to use this program as an, an external intervention that can increase marketplace literacy of study participants. Now, uh, next slide, please, Mother. Thanks. So we implemented three randomized controlled experiments in villages in South India and among the uh, Maasai tribe in Tanzania. Now, across these experiments, you will notice uh, three salient differences. In the first experiment, the control group did not receive any intervention, while in the second and third experiments, the control group received a sustainability literacy program that did not cover any marketing topics, but was of the same duration as the marketplace literacy program. The, the second difference is that we captured the variation in marketplace access either by dividing villages into high access and low access clusters, as in the first and the third experiments, or by measuring the individual level access within a group of similar villages or a cluster of similar villages. The third difference is in the outcome variables of each experiment, uh, which you see on the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So as we predicted, marketplace literacy resulted in an increase in all three forms of well-being, psychological, consumer-related, and entrepreneur-related. Now, an interesting finding was that the psychological and consumer-related well-being was higher for individuals with lower access to marketplaces. But on the other hand, entrepreneur-related benefits of marketplace literacy, such as uh, entrepreneurial intention and actual enterprise startup, increased for those with higher access to marketplaces in line, line with uh, what we had predicted. Uh, I call Nita uh, to continue the presentation. Thank you, Arun. So the theoretical implications of this work are that marketplace literacy, the, both the knowledge and the skills to effectively and beneficially participate in a marketplace is required to improve people's lives and livelihoods. And we wanted to distinguish between these two outcomes. In terms of lives, we're talking about better decision-making. And there's two parts of this, decision-making in terms of the ability to notice product quality or negotiate price, as well as confidence. And that confidence component is really important for subsistence consumers who might be intimidated in a formal marketplace. We also wanna talk about livelihoods, which is what Frank and his team talked about a lot, which is that marketplace literacy actually leads to income generation. And so the broad sweeping effects of marketplace literacy are incredible here. So we wanted to test whether it's just consumer literacy alone or whether you need this added component of entrepreneurial literacy to really help consumers make better decisions. So we ran a post hoc field experiment in Tanzania and we found that the synergy between consumer and entrepreneurial literacy actually helped consumers make better decisions. We can actually imply this to even modern markets or developed markets in which knowing how businesses and marketers actually market to us helps us make better decisions. That knowledge is really critical. We also wanna stress this, which Ashley brought up. Knowing why things occur is as important as knowing what and how they occur. Why is the cause and effect relationship, the deeper understanding of marketplace exchanges. And the last part is that marketplace access, which we take for granted, actually isn't ubiquitous even in the US. Many people lack access to financial and health resources and commercialized markets. So we really wanna urge future research to consider access as an important boundary condition in which to understand how marketing occurs and can benefit people. Next slide, please. What does this mean for practice? For firms and consumers, Marketplace literacy actually enables people to assess quality and negotiate price, which is incredibly important in many exchanges. What we found from our field experiments is that it actually led to income generation for 25% of our participants, which means that rural men and women actually started a micro enterprise as a result of a very short and scalable intervention. In our paper, we provide a scale for measuring marketplace literacy. And so we hope that future research and government agencies can use this scale 
to assess individual differences and design interventions accordingly. For nonprofit organizations and policymakers, we really suggest that they engender marketplace literacy by enabling access. What does this mean? Providing infrastructure to allow rural consumers to gain access to formal marketplaces. This is really important for well being. As well as a digital means to scale, we uh, suggest that future organizations think about scaling through WhatsApp, short video clips to even um, teach people about marketplace literacy. And the last slide. We have a call to action for practitioners and academics. We really urge future research to focus on consist subsistence consumers. These a meaningful consumer base, but they have a lot of uh, roadblocks to participate formally. And so we wanna understand their needs and demands more. We think that marketplace literacy should be measured and examined in addition to financial and consumer literacy. We know about consumer knowledge, consumer expertise, we want marketplace literacy to be at the forefront of individual differences. And also that engendering entrepreneurship should be a, pr a priority for marketers from a pathway to a better world with the use of marketing. And this is what Frank talked about as well. So we really second and echo the thought that marketing should consider entrepreneurship more. So thank you, this has been so much fun. Thank you to the entire team and to the journal marketing. Um, we look forward to your questions. Here we go. All right, so uh, thank you all uh, for being here today. Uh, my name is Emily Garbinski. Um, I just joined the faculty at Cor Cornell University um, this summer. Uh, so the work that I'm about to present today represents research that I did while I was on the faculty at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, I had two amazing co-authors on this project. Uh, Nicole Mead, who's in attendance today, she's at York University in Toronto, as well as Daniel Gregg, who's at the University of New England in Australia. Uh, so uh, this work uh, was a project that Nicole and I actually started working on uh, in 2015 when I was still a PhD student at Stanford. Um, and so at the time, we were just uh, chatting over coffee one day uh, about all of these scary statistics. So you see a lot of newspaper articles such as this one that I'm showing on this screen, where you see stats such that 76% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck and people aren't going to be adequately prepared when it comes time for them to retire. Uh, but something that we thought uh, was rather interesting is that when you survey people and ask them about their own finances, the majority of people think that when it comes to their own financial behavior, that they're doing okay, and that these scary, scary statistics pertain to other people. Uh, so this led us to a hypothesis that we had was that on average, people think they are more financially responsible than they actually are. And this false belief about people's own financial perceptions actually discourages them from saving. Right? So why did we have this hypothesis uh, in the first place? Well, we drew from uh, a lot of literature on positive illusions. Right. What are positive illusions? They're this idea that people tend to think they're better than they actually are. And we see this across a variety of domains, not just financial domains. Um, and what research on positive illusions tells us is that when people hold positive illusions, they have this belief that bad things are happening to other people and not to themselves. So if you cast this in terms of savings behavior, people think that oh, other people are going to have their car break down and not be able to pay for it, that's not going to happen to me. Um, and what we also know from research on positive illusions is that they engender this belief that one can act in an ideal manner at a later point in time, right? So just because I'm not saving money right now, people who hold positive illusions think that they'll have the option to save money at a later point in time. Right? And lastly, uh, what we know from research on self-regulation is that when people do not perceive a discrepancy between their behavior and their ideal standard, they don't change their behavior. So 
So cast in terms of our research project, if people don't notice that there's a difference between their past fi financial behaviors and their ideal standard of being a financially responsible person, they're going to continue behaving as they have been doing, which in this case is not saving money. So what we wanted to do in this particular project is develop an intervention that makes people view themselves and their financial behavior a bit more realistically um, and do this in a way that can be implemented uh, in practice. Right? And our logic for this uh, was relatively simple. So the theoretical rationale behind this is that if you develop an intervention that makes people realize that they're not as financially responsible as they think they are, uh, then they'll notice that there's this difference between their past behavior and their, their ideal standard, and they'll become motivated to close this gap and restore these perceptions of financial responsibility. And one way that they can do this is by saving money. Right, so how did we do this? How did we make people realize that they're not as financially responsible as they think they are? Uh, well, we conducted a series of extensive pretests uh, on a variety of populations. So the example that I'm showing you here is for North American adults. And we uh, developed a pool of behaviors, um, and these behaviors are what we call superfluous spending behaviors. So what are common types of behaviors where people are choosing to spend money instead of save it? Right? So you can see this example here. So uh, one behavior that we identified is people choosing to go out to eat at a more expensive restaurant instead of a cheaper one. Um, and what we did with these behaviors and with this frequency information is we developed a scale measure such that when we asked people how often they were doing this, we were able to construct the scale such that the majority of participants when they answered these questions would fall on the upper end of the scale. And this uh, having people fall at the upper end of the scale is something that uh, was very important for our intervention because we know from past research by Norbert Schwartz and others that when people fall on the upper ends of a scale, they're inferring information about themselves and in particular about the relative frequency of their behavior compared to other people. Right? So when we're asking people this set of five behaviors and they're noticing that for all five, they're falling on the upper end of, the, of these scale items such uh, for things such as buying things at full price instead of waiting for it to go on sale, buying something they want instead of foregoing the purchase, they're then realizing that, hey, maybe I'm not as financially responsible as I thought I was and that this will then in turn motivate them to save more money for the future. So uh, in the paper, we tested this uh, on a variety of populations, but in the interest of, of time today, I just want to tell you about one of the field experiments that we did uh, in Uganda. And this was a project that was overseen by the third author, Daniel Gregg, um, where he invited uh, 250 coffee growers to participate uh, in this larger financial management study. And so what he had these coffee growers do is they were incentivized to keep a daily financial diary. Um, and this was couched in terms of a, a larger project, uh, which was beneficial for us because the key dependent variable we were interested in in this project was savings behavior. But we, marry, we measured other uh, things which prevented participants from uh, ascertaining what uh, the key thing was that we were interested in in this study. Right. So uh, what we did was we measured people's savings behavior for one week before the intervention. And then we randomly assigned 250 coffee growers to either the superfluous spender condition or the control condition. And I'll give you more information about this on the next slide. And then we measured their savings behavior for two weeks following the intervention. Right. So what did the intervention look like? Right? Well, in uh, both conditions, we had an enumerator visit each household and ask participants uh, these five questions that you see on the screen here. And these are five behaviors that we identified in pretests as being superfluous spending behavior. So you can see, for example, how often they're choosing to do things like buy a soda or a soft drink instead of drinking water, visiting a local restaurant instead of cooking at home, so on and so forth. 
The only difference in the superfluous spender condition was that for these five questions, the enumerator held up uh, this scale and had people point to where they fell along this continuum. Um, and what happened was that the majority of participants, over 90%, uh, were falling in the upper end of the scale for all five behaviors. Right in the control condition, right? These were just open ended questions that we asked the participants. Um, and because there was no scale measure, they weren't able to infer the relative frequency of these savings of these spending behaviors. Right. So what did we see? Well, if we compare savings behavior uh, before the intervention and after, we see that in the control condition, uh, in the absence of this relative frequency information, there was no difference in savings behavior. So these people on average were saving about 12% of their income, uh, both before the intervention and after. Whereas if we look at those in the superfluous spender intervention condition, we see that they're saving significantly more of their income after the intervention than before, right? And we see um, that they're almost doubling the amount of savings uh, in this superfluous spender intervention condition. Right, so what do we conclude from this? Uh, well, one of the reasons why we think this is so interesting is because there's a lot of past research, uh, including some of my own past work, uh, where people argue or are trying to make the case that in order to get people to save more, something you should do is get people to feel better about themselves. Uh, but what we do in this particular project is show one instance where making people feel just a little bit worse about themselves or realizing that they haven't been as financially responsible as they think they are actually motivates them to save more. In terms of better world implications, well, we know that saving money is positively associated with both financial and emotional well-being. So the question becomes, how can we implement this in, in practice to encourage people to save more money for the future? Right, so how can we help uh, these Americans uh, save more money? Right, so a few ideas that my co-authors and I had um, uh, involve using a variety of organizations. And because we expect that this intervention is relatively transient, something that we wanna communicate is the importance of administering this intervention or these five questions at these crucial decision points. So asking people, five questions that deal with the superfluous spending behaviors at these key points, such as when they're opening a savings account, uh, setting a savings goal or planning for retirement could be one way to get them commit to commit to save more money in the future. Right. And in terms of how could we implement this um, in developing countries, so in the absence of these uh, enumerators that Daniel, our co-author, had access to, we envision that these five behaviors could be administered through the use of cell phones uh, by community-based savings and loan organizations. Right. So uh, some emerging research questions. So some, some questions that my co-author team and I are still interested in answering because you can't answer everything in one paper, but some ideas for future research. Uh, so we're curious to know, for example, if there's a relationship between personal savings and self-enhancement on a global level. So as you can imagine, our intervention is dependent on the fact that people view saving money as a positive behavior. But are there other parts of the world, for example, where saving has negative associations? So one could imagine, for example, that someone could view a saver as someone who's cheap or stingy. Um, so in what parts of the world uh, do these associations exist? And is there some way to shift these associations to become more positive to spur future savings? Uh, another question that uh, we were interested in answering is, would the intervention affect outcomes other than saving? So as you can imagine, saving isn't the only way to restore perceptions of financial responsibility. Uh, so would gently shattering these positive illusions affect other things, such as people's likelihood of getting an extra job or selling goods that they no longer need? Um, and we would also be interested in looking at how this intervention compares to or complements existing interventions that are aimed to um, inspire people to save more money. Right. 
Uh, so uh, that's all the time that I had for today, but really looking forward uh, to answering questions uh, now and in the breakout room sessions. And thank you again so much for this opportunity to present our work.